Okay, today's uh, episode of Occupy Interview is going to be with Kevin Costola. He is from Dissenter, uh, FireDogLake.com. He is an author and a filmmaker. He wrote an article about uh, the crackdown on Occupy movement uh, via uh, Freedom Information FOIA request. Uh, my co-host is going to be Terry Bain. This is James. Our uh, engineer is going to be Brattery. We got help in the uh, chat room from Katie Droxel. And uh, why don't you start us off, Terry? Am I coming through okay? Yeah, we hear you. Go ahead. All righty. I just wanted to make sure I had the cough switch in the right direction. Uh, today's guest, as you already introduced, is Kevin. And can you say hello, Kevin? Hello. Uh, got a going to have to try to put a lot into a half an hour show. We're going to basically have three segments here. Uh, Kevin's the author of a book out on uh, Brad Manning and uh, wanted to kind of start out with it was news to me yesterday when you were telling me that that uh, that Mr. Moore had basically said he was kind of the start of the Occupy movement. Could you kind of give us some of that background? Sure. About, um, I want to say two or three months ago uh, he was at a panel that was put together by The Nation magazine, and he said during this panel discussion that uh, if you thought about uh, PFC Bradley Manning, who's accused of releasing classified information to WikiLeaks, then you might be able to connect him to Occupy Wall Street. And how he connected Occupy Wall Street to Manning was he said, think of the information that was released about Tunisia and Egypt. And many of the people there read those documents, and it, it's been acknowledged by human rights organizations like Amnesty International that people in the country read the uh, cables that were released, the U.S. state embassy cables, and they uh, were taken aback by what they were reading about the corruption in their country and what their political leaders had been doing and uh, part of what you know the United States had been concealing, so things that they weren't able to know themselves. This sort of fed into the uprisings. And he wasn't saying that the uprisings wouldn't have happened, but he was just saying this played a role in fueling them. Well, we know that Occupy Wall Street was inspired by the Arab Spring, and we know that many people who started the in, in the core group on September 17 looked at what was happening there and, and looked at what was happening in Spain and, and, and saw the sort of uh, domino effect that was going on with occupations um, and to rear occupation being the like very first and foremost uh thing that people in Occupy Wall Street took note of when they went out themselves and put them th themselves forward on, on September 17. And so this is what Michael Moore was saying, that in a way you can connect Bradley Manning. If he did release the information, you can connect him to Occupy Wall Street. Uh, since you've had a chance uh, with the book, uh, what's, there, there was some concern uh, about private Manning's physical condition. Uh, can you kind of elaborate on that and have you, has, has he been doing better here of late or what is the status? Yes. Uh, the issue with his physical condition was how was he being treated in the uh, prison that he was being held at. He was being held at Quantico Marine Brig and that uh, changed because a lot of people, activists who probably are now participants in the Occupy movement came out and uh, we're, we're protesting. Uh, there were also some, there was some journalism that contributed, uh, particularly, I think, from uh, Glenn Greenwald, who covered the way that he was um, being held in uh, solitary confinement and uh, the, the way that he had uh, 23 hours a day, he was kept in this one uh, small cell and had about an hour to uh, move around, but there was quite a limitation. Uh, there was also, an, at one point, he was uh, he had upset a guard there and was had all his clothing removed, so he, was spe he spent a couple days uh, where he had absolutely no clothing at all because of something he had said to an officer. And this sort of treatment uh, was, all, was a result of him being put on something called the Prevented, Pre Prevention of Injury Watch. 
Uh, and there was little justification for this. Uh, some documents released showed that uh, psychologists had uh, disputed this designation, but the Brig uh, staff went ahead, the Brig officers went ahead and kept this designation, and so it created a backlash, and uh, people said he was cruelly and inhumanely treated, and you had the State Department spokesperson named P.J. Crawley say that this was uh, just, you know, violation of his rights and counterproductive, and, and then you saw that he was transferred to in Kansas, and that is the prison where he is primarily being held today. So because of the efforts of people around the world who raised this issue, um, it, uh, it, he's, he's in good, uh, he's in much better situation. And I, I've seen him myself reporting on the proceedings, and he looks pretty well considering the fact that this is a person who has been in pretrial confinement for almost 700 days. Incredible. Uh, sometime I've taken a look at, at the effects of solitary confinement. Uh, how would that kind of treatment compare with the average person who's at Guantanamo, the prisoners there? And again, this is an American serviceman, Private Manning, that we're talking about. Uh, could you address that, Kevin? Yeah, I, you know, I don't think it's that uh, different. I mean, there's there's very many similarities in the way that Briley Manning has been handled uh, that just uh, make you think of the way that Guantanamo detainees have been treated. I think, you know, obviously, Guantanamo detainees have been treated in way worse ways than Manning, but there are some areas where they're similar, such as what you're suggesting, uh, the the limitations placed on him for solitary confinement, which which the military also claims is not solitary confinement. But if you look at it, he is being held in isolation. So it is, to any observer, solitary confinement. And so you, you, you know that he's being treated in a way that most people should not be forced to submit to, especially since he hasn't even been convicted of the crime yet. So you can't even argue that this is a, it has anything to do with the, the sentence he is serving. Uh, so secondly, the other thing I just would add in the way that he's treated like a Guantanamo detainee is personally, I'll just make the quick point that there's uh, legal proceedings going on in the run-up to his trial where there are court documents, and I won't go into too many details uh, because we're talking about Occupy mostly, but the documents here are being kept secret from the press in a way that doesn't typically happen in public trials. So a lot of press organizations and even Manning's defense are protesting because the reality of the situation is there is an agreement between the Pentagon and the press that military commissions have transparency and people have access to records. And that is not even happening with these proceedings. So press who cover have a really hard time accurately covering this because they don't get to see court filings. Since NDAA has been passed uh, and, and technically the government can just declare Occupy supporters or Tea Party supporters uh, in the same boat as Private Manning, I assume. Uh, would this? Would there be some similarities in how they would be treated? Uh, well, I think it just has to do with how we've seen in the last decade, um, at, you know, at least going back to Bush, perhaps even further, that there seems to be a second-class justice system being established. You maybe might even take it a step further if you want to uh, be uh, give a thorough uh, critique of the change in society. Maybe there's a third and second class system. And then the first class system, of course, is the one that the uh, people who, you know, if let's say if any bankers so happened to find themselves being charged with committing a crime, which probably won't happen, but let's say they did, they would probably get to go into this first class system where they didn't get treated uh, inhumanely or cruelly, 
and they probably had a lot of benefit of the doubt given to them. On the other hand, with the second class or maybe even a second and third class system, you've got people who are placed into situations where they are tortured or inhumanely treated before they even get to a trial. When they get to the trial, there's evidence that's admitted into the trial that's obtained, obtained through torture. If the evidence is admitted at all, in some cases you have, like for Bradley Manning's case, his lawyer, David Coombs, is trying to get information admitted that is uh, not being allowed by the government uh, that is prosecuting Manning. So this is uh, uh, an issue that all of us face because... Uh, people who are engaged in their First Amendment rights, who are finding themselves in court before judges, no doubt, are finding these uh, situations are being used against them in a way that makes you wonder if people really have equal protection under the law. And again, today that's private manning. Tomorrow it could be you or me or anybody in our listening audience with NDAA. Uh-huh. Okay, I'd like to move on because we've got a lot to cover. <laughs> we can't really cover your entire book in 10 minutes, but we will have a link back to it because it was fascinating. Well, uh, thank you. You had a, an article that you did on Department of Homeland Security monitoring, and that was primarily what we were interested in today. Uh, could you address some of those issues? Sure. Uh, so uh, back in March, uh, actually on March 21st, an independent news website, Truthout, uh, which was the first news organization to submit a Freedom of Information Act request for Department of Homeland Security documents, they got a set and uh, published those documents which they had received. And uh, the man, his name is Jason Leopold, um, you know, started talking and, and, and put up a post and he was sharing uh these documents, which are basically amounted to bulletins, there were there were a few bulletins. Some of them showed what I had already known, which was that one of the things that made Homeland Security security leery of uh, Occupy Wall Street was anonymous, and the way that anonymous was uh, being a part of Occupy Wall Street that bothered uh, the Homeland Security Department, and. So they took note of that fact. And then there's also in the documents that were released, there's emails, and you can see that a division of the department is talking about what they're going to tell the press about the role that they are having in the crackdowns that are happening to Occupy groups. And so the... Um, so, so they ended up talking about the. Uh, sorry, I had an echo coming in my ear. Um, sorry about that. No, no, it's all right. Uh, so they noted one of the instances where they actually had been working with uh, Portland police because the Occupy Portland group was on Terry Shrunk uh, Plaza, and uh, that was an area where they had the uh, jurisdiction to use. Uh, federal protective services to go in and remove occupiers. So they did, in fact, deploy feds in that case to, uh, to to get rid of the Occupy camp. But there weren't any other cases that they admitted or copped to in these emails. And if uh, fusion centers, because um, these are like, uh, you know, big high-tech intelligence centers that have been established around the country, uh, those were actually instructed to stay away from Occupy groups. Um, at least that is what the official line was. Now, there's there's many more documents to be released. So uh, there's, there's a lot here that makes it doubtful that Homeland Security was involved in a clampdown to the extent that it was. That doesn't mean that there wasn't any other federal activity going on, but there are documents still to be released that could show more as, as to what kind of intelligence reports were being put together to warn people about Occupy. And there's also the issue of the fact that the FBI is, I, I want to raise this quickly, is the FBI 
is an air is, is an organization or agency that the uh, truth out and other people have been trying to get documents on occupy from but they claim that they haven't done anything on occupy and interestingly enough the homeland security documents prove that to be a blatant lie because it mentions in one of the bulletins that the fbi was notified of uh of some of these issues of, of, of threat information surrounding Occupy and perhaps even the role Ana An Anonymous was playing in the protests. And so they definitely have documents and they're playing games. And that's actually why Jason Leopold has sued the FBI because they're lying. Okay. And Kevin, I guess, uh, I guess it comes down to the, the point here. It's interesting that they seem to be defensive about fessing up that there is a federal involvement. I would assume that's because of the First Amendment uh, that any, that, that would be, if there's any federal money, one penny of federal money being spent to try to stop people's uh, freedom to protest, uh, then that would be unconstitutional, correct? Yeah, they're, um, they're very concerned and they, um, they, they make a point to in the in their public affairs department to instruct in a uh, in areas where it's possible that you had uh, interests from the homeland security to clamp down, and uh, they try to make sure that they're they're not doing that. And it's very clear from the emails that they were trying to cover their tracks, uh, which makes it possible that they were just trying to hide. Uh, because what's interesting to me about these documents is that they admit that at some point these are going to become public because they knew that people were requesting these documents for release. So they knew that their email conversations were going to end up being read by you and me. And so it's almost uh, raises the question of, is there something being hidden? And they were just consciously making sure they didn't type out any emails that talked about what the feds were doing. I just wanted to remind our listening audience that's listening in while we're streaming live, uh, there is a chat page at the bottom of the of the link. And if there's any audience questions, uh, this would be a good time to throw those in while we've got Kevin online. We'll be able to see those and pass those on. I um, wanted to go ahead now and the, the last article that you did uh, – was really interesting. Uh, you did a really good recap on the staying power of Occupy. And you had a quote here that I thought pretty much summed it all up. Uh, now is the moment to examine how they started, what has happened, uh, what type of impact they've had, and how we could do better. I'm paraphrasing a little bit because I can't read my own handwriting. Uh, those are some of the issues uh, it was really fascinating in your article, and again, there'll be links to that. Uh, can you address some of that for me here? Uh, I'm sure our audience would be interested here. You've had a chance to actually tour some of the Occupy sites. Yeah, I, I went, uh, so just so people know, uh, Fire Dog Lake did something called Occupy Supply, so many of the groups that are out there, and I would actually guess many of the ones that are still going strong and organizing themselves, uh, Fire Dog Lake had a role in helping them continue throughout the winter uh, because we had um, liaisons that were working with Occupy groups, and we had a union produce gear so that people could stay warm throughout the winter. And the, there was a lot sent out uh, to help people with, with hats being sent out, with gloves, with uh, just making sure that people were warm and could continue to organize because we didn't want people to go away. We recognized that if people went back to their homes during the winter, this would totally die and collapse. And then back in spring, it would be a lot harder to start. And so part of uh, the article you're referencing is that I think one of the biggest assets of the movement is that it has been around since September, and that's not a lie. And they didn't really hibernate. Some groups engaged in less action because of the cold weather. But in some places, 
it's it's no different. Like, uh, let's talk about the people up in Fairbanks, Alaska. They didn't quit, and they uh, were organizing throughout the winter in the and cold minus thirty uh, weather, and they were out there and were proudly engaged in occupying. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, now I think it's the time to think about what people can do uh, because the media is just now beginning to tune back in. Uh, they know that there's a May 1st protest for May Day that's supposed to be huge. Um, they've had the NATO protest in Chicago put on their radar as possibly having many Occupy groups coming out. Of course, the G8 was going to be there, but it isn't any longer. That used to be a big date. Uh, they know that there's probably plans for the summer and that Occupy is going to make use of the, the coming warm weather. So uh, while there has been very minimal media coverage in the past month, there hasn't really been much attention to Occupy, at least compared to November. It's like now, with them not really paying attention to you, you do have an opportunity as an occupier to talk about where your movement has come from and where you might be going. And I think it's probably a good thing to talk about what you can do because there are horror stories I've heard that I'm not going to share specifically because I respect what people are trying to do out there and I know it's difficult, but I've heard of internal squabbles that... Uh, people should probably find the courage to confront and sort out so that they can continue because communities still need you and those people who had issues with one another should find a way to get past that and, and come back to organizing to do what needs to be done in their city. Brandon Turboville, uh, as I mentioned, uh, he was on our show last week and he had done an really superb job putting together some of the information on the Delphi technique which was used and I don't want to go in and redo last week's show again but basically it addresses uh, some of the issues you've just mentioned about the internal problems and I think as the Delphi technique starts to be unraveled I believe that blockade will be also kind of helping out on the internal situation we've got going. We did have a guest question uh, come in on the chat page. Uh, what is your take on Anonymous? And Basically, they were asking, are they for real? Uh, evidently, the, the Department of Homeland Security seems to think so, since they're monitoring them. Uh, do you have any input on that? or? I, I think that uh, it's, it's interesting because I don't think that they are that big of a threat. I, I think perhaps in individual circumstances, if you um, are bothered by what they have done to some government infrastructure and to some corporations, then perhaps uh, they have opened themselves up to prosecution. But I don't think as a group that they are uh, a threat that needs monitoring by Homeland Security uh, any more than Occupy, and I would argue that a lot of what they do on the internet is uh, engaging in a, a new form of civil disobedience, except they're doing it in the virtual realm. So as long as they're not uh, violating uh, freedom of expression or freedom of speech um, by deciding that uh, a certain... Like in, in one case, Anonymous was upset with a PBS documentary. That didn't really set well with me because I think they have a right to express themselves if they don't say what they, if, if, if they don't do or produce the film that Anonymous wants, then that's another, another issue. But I don't think they deserve to be hacked or shut down because of that. But let's talk about like if the FBI is abusing their authority in going after Anonymous and, and they get a uh, denial of service attack and uh, their web server goes down temporarily, obviously the government's going to come after Anonymous, but at the same time, that doesn't seem to me much different than sitting in and like the EPA or sitting in and like the FBI or sitting in somewhere 
if citizens wanted to sit in so that they could protest. I think a lot of occupiers would see what uh, members of Anonymous have done in many cases as being like a virtual sit-in. I think that's really a good point, too, that you've raised. Uh, there's a We know for sure that there have been infiltration attempts. That was last week's show with Delphi. Uh, Black Block is an infiltration attempt on Occupy. Um, looks like Anonymous may also have some infiltration, but some of the some of the uh, anonymous actions seem to be different than some of the others. Um, and again, is that something that you're picking up? Could be an infiltration attempt on them. And if so, are you picking up anything on how they're trying to address their infiltration problems? Right. Well, I mean, I don't want to stray too much from Occupy, but just quickly, uh, they did uh, pick up a person back in June of last year whose name was Sabu and turned him, the FBI flipped him into an informant and he was working with the FBI and he went back to doing everything he had been doing with Anonymous but then began to pick off uh, people um, and uh, put them into situations where they were uh, committing crimes and uh, then at the end of the year, uh, December into January, you had the FBI starting to put together uh, the arrest warrants for these individuals, and he had been giving them evidence so that they could be placed under greater surveillance. And so, uh, yeah, I think it's a fair concern how many people who do uh, work, a lot of these people have identities on Twitter, how many of these anonymous identities on, twi on Twitter that, you know, may be supportive of Occupy, uh, how many of them are working for the FBI? I think you have to just pay close attention because uh, in the work that I've done, it seems like the more erratic people and the ones that want to push you um, to an extreme are usually, uh, if they're not mentally unstable, then in the end you find out figuring that they were working for the government and were trying <laughs> to con people into doing something that they shouldn't do. And, and you can tell because they wanted you to go to this extreme that you would lose people. Because Anonymous really does want public support. I think at the end of the day, same with Occupy, you want public support. So you're not going to do something stupid or totally, you know, you're not going to do violent acts and, and you're not going to commit... Um, Anything that's going to totally turn off people if it isn't going to help you advance a political cause. And so uh, I think that's just something people have to look out for is that there are people out there on Twitter who, who, who may have been flipped by the FBI. It's just a reality. We've got a question from, uh, from the chat page. Um, one of the infiltration techniques that they've spotted uh, are homeless people being dumped on Occupy camps? Is that something that you've been picking up? I heard a anecdotal story from Portland uh, that, that the whole place was starting to look like a homeless camp. And it turned out that there were, there were reports that the police were actually rounding up homeless people and dropping them into Occupy. Is that anything you're picking up? Yeah, that, that happened all over. Um, I'd have to hear more about how that was... Uh, working to infiltrate uh, the group, um, but I do think it was uh, intentional in cases uh, to bring them down. So I guess what I'm saying is I don't know if the homeless people were knowingly entering the camp to uh, bring, bring it down, but I think that a lot of police officers were telling homeless people around the country in the past months, there are these camps, they've got food. I also hear they got shelter. They'll give you a warm blanket. And a sleeping bag, too, possibly. So go ahead, and uh, we're going to drop you off here and and stop wandering around and doing the things that we consider illegal uh, because we've criminalized homelessness. And take yourself to the camp area because they're here right now, and they might be here for who knows how long. And at least until we come in with our... Um, you know, all our weapons and, and armed gear and equipment and, and run them out. They'll be there until we do that. So go down there and hang around. And then, yeah, it became a drag, like in all kinds of cities um, that are trying to start 
uh, a movement, then all of a sudden you've got homeless people who uh, do stealing, they're into drugs, they're doing this and that, and they, they, they'll tell you things that they want your movement to do, and it uh, creates splinters because you don't, uh, you don't know these people. And, um, and if you want to know these people and, and you want them to become part of the movement, they're not cooperative and they're loose cannons that you uh, have to try to deal with on a daily basis. Well, they are part of the 99% and they do seem to be a growing sector. And really on one level, it's nice to know that the Occupy people were feeding them and providing them with a shelter since the government services that we're all paying for with our tax dollars don't seem to be doing a lot to help. No, not at all. Uh, per perhaps that was a form of blowback, and and that does seem to be the theme for this show. Uh, that that Bradley Manning uh, kind of helped begin the Occupy. Uh, I'm not sure when he joined the military, that was what he intended to do. I would imagine probably that was not his intention, but unintended uh, consequences seems to be the major theme of this half hour. Uh, we're running out of time. Uh, it was absolutely a fascinating show, and we really would like to get you back on. We'll be keeping an eye on your articles. We'll have a link up to your book, uh, your your uh, your site there, Fire Dog Lake. Uh, anything you wanted to add? Uh, we're getting ready to have uh, lunch. Right. I'll just say on Twitter, um, you can follow the stuff that I'm doing on a regular basis at K G O S Z as in zebra. T O L A K G O S Z T O L A, and a cover Occupy, WikiLeaks, Bradley Manning, civil liberties issues of transparency, protest, right to dissent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So thank you for having me on the show. <laughs> hey, thank you for being here. You're doing a great job, uh, and and we really do appreciate it. We will say what we've been saying to everybody in the Occupy movement. Thanks for standing, Kevin. I wanted to get a thank out to uh, James, my co-host, and uh, our engineering was uh, was Brattery, and a fine job he's done as per normal. And Kevin, uh, once again, thanks, and we'll be back in touch with you. Uh, but for now, we're out of time, and Ocean Radio is going to have to sign off. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again next week. Bye. <laughs>